This is Moderate Rebels, and here are some highlights from our upcoming interview with the Saudi journalist and activist Ali Al Ahmad. Yeah, the American support has been always there for the Saudis. If if they support them against their war war crimes in Yemen and killing many thousands of children, uh, the killing one 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 person is not that big of a deal. If you by comparison, the same thing when he Mohammed bin Salman took hostage the Prime Minister of Lebanon, Saad Al Hariri, uh, and elected. Uh, head of a government and nothing happened really. People, they want to sell you the illusion that an absolute monarchy could be a nice and genteel uh, uh, government. It, it, it can't It can't be. You cannot have a, a, an absolute monarch that, that's going to offer human rights or reforms. That's just, you know, it's impossible. Mohammed bin Salman, when he came, he was received by, by Google, by uh, Twitter, and uh, you have to see the look on Mark Zuckerberg's face as if he was this uh, 18-year-old with her, with her, uh, you know, Prince Charming, and they were holding hands too. It was, it was shameful. We have to share power, devolve power to the people, the government by the people. I've used these terms for a long time, so that was why uh, they were angry at me. I mean, they took away my citizenship, my passport, jailed my brothers, tortured them, tried to lure me and kidnap me, spied on me. They, they even tried to buy me out. There was a message here to, to send to the loyalists that this is the, the grim end will face you. And as the Saudis say, our hand is, in the, our reach is, is, is far and we can bring you. I've, I've been told that myself and other uh, dissidents were told the same way. Of course, you know, you have countries in, 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 like the U.S. and the U.K., they don't care. In fact, they will never say, and they have never said, we encourage a government that is uh, nationalist, that, that is elected, that, is, that represents the people. We support the people to, for, and their aspiration. Like they do it with other countries, like in China or with Russia and, 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 um, and Iran, definitely. But they never say anything about that in Saudi Arabia. This whole thing is not, it's not about human rights. It's not about democracy. It's about interests of, of certain countries in the region and the position that the, the U.S. Uh, uh, government is taking now, I, I, I'm afraid it's, it's about interest, not about, uh, you know, sincere concern for the life and safety of Jamal Khashoggi. I'll never apologize for the United States of America, ever. I don't care what the facts are. Why are we going to sit down and talk to these quote-unquote moderate rebels? Who are the truly moderate rebels? The search for the moderate rebel. Do these moderate rebels exist? Moderate rebels. You are listening to Moderate Rebels. I'm Ben Norton, and today I'm joined by Max Blumenthal and also the guest Ali Al Ahmad, who is a Saudi dissident and a leading expert on Saudi politics. He lives in Washington, D.C., and uh, is you know a leading analyst on what's been going on inside Saudi Arabia and in the war in Yemen. So today we're going to talk about um, several different issues involving Saudi Arabia. Uh, one of the big issues that's in the media right now is the disappearance of a Saudi dissident, Jamal Khashoggi, who actually was probably killed. Um, Turkey has claimed that he was killed and potentially his body was dismembered by a Saudi squad, uh, a hit team squad, that was sent to the Saudi consulate inside Istanbul. Um, but before we get to, to that and talk about the details of this, this really crazy case, we're also going to talk about the war in Yemen. We're going to talk about Mohammed bin Salman, who's the Saudi crown prince who, you know, the Western media whitewashes as some kind of beloved reformer. And uh, a lot of related issues, Trump's arms sales to Saudi Arabia. Uh, so there's a lot to cover. And thanks for joining us, Ali. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, Ali, uh, it's great to have you here. Uh, you are one of the most outspoken Saudi dissidents in Washington. Um, I assume that, you know, if you went back to Saudi Arabia, um, they might uh, not be too happy. I don't know if you'd wind up in 15 pieces, but basically you are an opponent of the Saudi royal family. Uh, you are not loyal to any aspect of the royal family. And I think that distinguishes you from Jamal Khashoggi, Absolutely. who everyone in Washington is up in arms about. He was a Washington Post columnist. I actually briefly met him in 2015. Uh, this was before, you know, uh, MBS, Mohammed bin Salman was crown prince, uh, before King Salman, the mad king was king, 
King Abdullah was still in, and uh, Khashoggi was uh, talking about doing some initiatives uh, with his government. He was very still loyal to the Saudi government. I wonder if you could talk just about his background and why he was seen. Uh, someone like him who had been loyal for decades to the Saudi royal family had been seen as a threat by bin Salman. I, I think that was the that's why he was a threat. Uh, he was uh, not only a loyalist who served uh, the monarchy closely for uh, uh, since the nineteen early nineteen eighties, and uh, uh, his last official uh, public official uh, uh, position was uh, advising uh, or assistant to uh, Turkey Faisal, the uh, Saudi ambassador here, and he also served him in London as a, as a, as an you know as an assistant advisor. And he was in charge of actually countering uh, any negative stories, uh, including that we were uh, putting out. Uh, and uh, so there was something, our relationship, uh, my relationship with him was uh, basically uh, on the opposite side. And he, he, uh, he on many occasions, uh, targeted uh, my, my person and, uh, and what we did. Khashoggi attacked you in the media. Uh, uh, yes. Yes, uh, and so I can say that he served them very well for uh, for many years, for decades. So, and he and he remained loyal to the uh, to the monarchy itself, to the regime. Uh, what he did, he criticized Mohammed bin Salman, maybe on behalf of other members of the ruling family. I'm not sure, uh, but he definitely never criticized King uh, uh, Salman or. Uh, uh, the other princes who were her, his, his patrons, like uh, Turkey Al Faisal and Khalid Al Faisal. So you are talking about a person who is within, and he's a loyalist uh, critic. That's I think the best description. And because he was an insider, uh, he served with uh, members of the ruling family for a long time. I think that made him a greater target. Because myself, as I've been a dissident, I'm a target. Yes. But I've been a dissident, but in Washington, they dismiss you. You are a dissident. Uh, you're not an insider. He uh, actually had to give, uh, you know, to be at a greater risk because he, he was once there and he could have shut his mouth and uh, uh, applauded uh, Mohammed bin Salman and nothing would happen to him. He would probably would not be used because his generations are gone. You know, so his patrons are gone and marginalized. So that is why he was targeted, because... If there are other Jamal Khashoggi's, people who were in the palace, and now they, they, when they were asked to leave, they turn against the palace. These are called traitors that me must that must be punished severely, and that's right. why um, Khashoggi was not only killed. They actually had an opportunity in uh, bringing him back with a nice offer, and you know, and they didn't have to do anything to him, and they would have had him in the country, and that's it, it's over. But I think. Because he was loyal to other members of the ruling family, they, they banned him from going. And because maybe he wanted to play to continue to play a role, he was still not that old and he wanted to be some, doing, do something. And uh, he calculated wrongly, thinking that if he criticized Mohammed bin Salman alone, other members of the ruling family will, will, uh, will guarantee his security. That didn't happen. Um, uh, and like I said, I think him becoming a, a, a sort of so, so, quote unquote traitor of of uh, of uh, the king or MBS made him a greater target, and that's why he was killed in this horrible manner. Let's talk more about what actually happened. The details are not entirely clear. There's been conflicting reports. What we do know is that Khashoggi was entering the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, and originally he had entered four days before. He was going there because uh, his wife was not legally recognized as his wife, and he was trying to get legal recognition, I guess, for his fiance. what was recognized as fiance. He went in four days before and was told to come back four days later, so clearly something was being planned. He came back, this was on October 2nd, and his fiance was waiting outside, and he never came out. Uh, we don't know what happened to his body. It's clear that he's been missing. Turkish intelligence claims that he was dismembered and put into different parts by this Saudi hit squad, and also Turkey released photos of this alleged hit squad. So can you talk about 
Uh, is this a kind of unprecedented case? I mean, clearly Saudi Arabia has killed a lot of dissidents. Uh, they behead peaceful dissidents inside the country. Um, but dismembering someone seems like a pretty, a pretty extreme version that we haven't seen thus far. Uh, I, I think uh, the, the, there was a message here to, to send to the loyalists that this is the, the grim end will face you. And as the Saudis say, our hand is in the, our reach is, is, is far and we can bring you. I've, I've been told that myself. And other uh, dissidents were told the same way. Uh, we haven't had a case of uh, uh, basically where uh, a dissident abroad is kidnapped and killed in, in Saudi in the Saudi council. Our famous uh, dissident in 1979, Nasser Said, who is known to basically every, he's maybe the only uh, national figure in the country because all everyone talks about him. Uh, in a loving way, because he is the original dissident. Uh, he was a writer and kidnapped from Beirut. So that guy was taken, by, uh, you know, uh, ironically, uh, by whom? By Turk al Faisal, the, the Khashoggi's patron. So Khashoggi should have basically suspected or, uh, or you know, feared such a, an end. But I think the pressure from his wife to, to get that uh, divorce uh, declaration so they can get married because she was pregnant. Uh, uh, I think great, so he took the risk. Anyway, so I think this is unprecedented in Saudi history in terms of the way it's done. Uh, they have killed people inside the country in the in sort of death squad manner. They did, uh, especially in Qatif, uh, and uh, they have uh, you know tried to do that to other people. Most of the cases of rendition were in, done with cooperation of, of hosting countries, like in Lebanon or in Malaysia. Um, uh, and in, in Lebanon, uh, at the time, was under the control of the PLO, basically. And the PLO gunman kidnapped Mr. Uh, and Said and handed him. So this is the first time this type of operation is done. Uh, so it's brazen. It reflects the uh, the identity and the behavior and mindset of uh, what, I, what I call mad, the mad king of Saudi Arabia, king uh, you know MBS, because he he's a bully. He 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 even abuses his own wife and, and uh, jails his own mother and brother and of course cousins. So that is his reaction to your to his critics, and I think the manner it was done with uh, you see the hit the hit team included two of MBS's uh, personal guards, and they did not try to hide that because their pictures uh, uh, were, were taken in the airport, uh, So and their pictures are available on, on social media and some on Saudi TV, uh, uh, YouTube uh, videos. So they, there was no attempt to hide the, the, that fact that MBS was uh, behind it, and the Turks said, obviously, <coughs> the high authority. Anyway, so... I think this is a message to the loyalists, more so to to to, to dissidents, and uh, uh, I think more of this will happen uh, if if nothing is taken, can, you know, if nothing is done by the Americans specifically. Yeah, I want to ask you about that. Um, I think about a year ago, um, Saad Al Faki, who is a dissident in London, uh, an anti-royalist, uh, went on Twitter and criticized Mohammed bin Salman as like the child king. And said, you know, he is losing the war in Yemen. The Houthis are routing us. This is pathetic. And uh, a guy named um, Saud al Qatani, who I'm sure you know well, who is an advisor to Mohammed bin Salman, immediately <laughs> chimed in on Twitter and said, Be careful, our assassination file is open again. I mean, he said this on Twitter. And um, actually, on February 7th, I believe, in a Washington Post column, Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, referred to Katani as the man who holds the blacklist of people that they want to take out. Uh, so it's very out in the open. Um, would you say that bin Salman is taking a more brazen approach to cracking down on loyalists, even assassinating them, uh, than, than previous uh, leadership has in the past? And would you, and to what extent would you attribute this to his relationship with the Trump administration and specifically Jared Kushner. Uh, there were reports earlier this year that Jared Kushner, sorry, last year, that Jared Kushner had actually passed on classified U.S. intelligence to bin Salman about his supposed enemies uh, to help propel his supposed anti-corruption purge. So, you know, talk about the brazenness and also whether you think the relationship with the Trump administration is fueling it. 
I think uh, uh, definitely uh, the Trump administration gave uh, Mohammed bin Salman greater security to conduct such operation, especially in Turkey, which uh, what Mr. Trump uh, dislikes and is is uh, at conflict with at the moment. So the Turks uh, will feel isolated, and they're still kind of isolated because there is no support uh, um, uh, to the Turkish uh, government in this from the Americans or or other NATO allies. Um, uh, but uh, uh, this is not the only reason. Uh, the American support has been always there for the Saudis. If if they support them against their war war crimes in Yemen and killing many thousands of children, uh, the killing one 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 person is not that big of a deal. If you by comparison, the same thing when he Mohammed bin Salman took uh, hostage the Prime Minister of Lebanon, Saad Al Hariri, uh, and elected uh, head of a government, and nothing happened really. So. Uh, he, that that encouraged right. you know, Mr. Bin Salman to do even more stuff you know, against uh, Khashoggi. It's just happened, though. I think that the reaction has been uh, surprising to me because this is the first time this uh, uh, Washington reacts so harshly against, uh, uh, n- namely, the Saudi monarchy. Uh, so sometimes they talk about Saudi in general, but here we're talking about Bin, bin Salman himself. So it looks like it's not only about Khashoggi, it was an opportunity, but there's something else. I have no idea what that is. It could be related to Mr. Trump's statement, oh, the king has to pay, the king has to pay. So Mohammed bin Salman doesn't want to pay. So let's uh, increase the pressure uh, using this case of Khashoggi against him. So I, I really don't know, but it's surprising. And I don't think, uh, I wouldn't say all of it, but some of it is not genuine. It's used for political uh, pressure to achieve something either it has to do with the peace with Israel or uh, with uh, some uh, other uh, uh, request made by the United States to Mohammed bin Salman. Mohammed bin Salman now feels that he cannot deliver on many of these things. That's why things are being cancelled. And at the same time, he's becoming more his own man, thinking that he doesn't need the U.S. He might want to be to make deal with the, with the Iranians or stop the wars in Yemen. Uh, and he's already made uh, uh, contacts with the Syrian uh, uh, government, so maybe that's the problem. Uh, and he thought to uh, to get the Turks uh, thinking. He calculated he has to go after the Turks basically because targeting right. Mr. Khashoggi in Turkey is targeting the Turkey. Great point, and he's also made uh, relations, improved relations significantly with Russia. Yes. Yeah, and this is actually a really good segue. I was going to ask you, Ali, about. Uh, specifically the the split between Saudi Arabia and Qatar and how Turkey has largely sided with Qatar. Uh, of course, Turkey is governed by the AKP, which is a Muslim Brotherhood affiliated party. Qatar is one of the large supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood in the region. Um, so that partially explains the political allegiances. But But Turkey and Saudi Arabia have been for a while now having some political conflicts. Part of it is also religious. Saudi Arabia, of course, sees itself as the leader of Islam, and Erdogan is trying to, you know, exercise more of that role. Um, so what's interesting about this this whole scandal is Turkey, which also imprisons more journalists than anywhere else in the world. So Erdogan doesn't have a lot of room to speak. But to be fair, Erdogan doesn't doesn't kill and dismember journalists and and like hide their bodies. Um, so I'm wondering if you could just talk about the geopolitics specifically of. Turkey and Qatar and Saudi Arabia, and how Al Jazeera and Qatar are using this, uh, this as, probably this like the assassination of a of a Saudi dissident to, you know, continue that to fan, to fan those flames. Yes, the uh, you know you what you have here you have uh, two sides to to this the Saudi Egyptian Emirati side. That's why those uh, planes that that flew the the hit team two of them one flew to Egypt. And then to Riyadh, and then the other one to to flew to UAE, and then to Riyadh, which which is uh, weird. In, in, you know, it, they may wanted to. There is this alliance between these three countries vis-a-vis Turkey, and Turkey hosts dissidents from from Egypt, Muslim Brotherhood dissidents mostly, and Saudi dissidents, and uh, dissidents from the UAE. Most of them are in in, in, in Turkey, so uh, the, this could have been an attempt to break relations. Not only to get rid of uh, uh, Khashoggi and scare the loyalists into uh, uh, not to defect, but also to uh, es- escalate with with Turkey, which is facing economic um, uh, problems, 
uh, the Saudis view this that they are weak, they cannot react. Um, after all, you know, we have seen Turkey be used as a killing zone for other journalists. Like there was a, uh, a Iranian journalist who was killed and uh, uh, last year, and uh, nothing happened. So you are l looking at this opportunity that Saudi want to to pressure the Turks, and they will have American support. But I think maybe they might have miscalculated by targeting Khashoggi, who who is uh, seen as a Saudi friend uh, um, and. Uh, and uh, I'm an American friend, and he has a lot of people uh, here, supporters, uh, from the reaction. So we'll see what happens. But I think you you will see this this game play in terms of the relationship. The Saudis just two days ago suspiciously issued a, a public statement saying that, oh, the rumors of uh, Saudi Arabia cutting its relationship with Turkey are false. With they, they, this is unprompted, so it may be a message that they will. Uh, if, if the Turks push uh, greater in terms of uh, uh, releasing all the information and the reported video of the killing that they have. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that there was a miscalculation and it's it was really stunning to me, so stunning that I was willing to entertain the possibility that Hashogji would just kind of turn up at Walmart with Elvis or something that he was just, <laughs> you know, missing and that there had been some kind of misunderstanding. Um, but, you know, this is so embarrassing, not just to Trump or uh, to, you know, Saudi Arabia's defenders in uh, Washington, who you know well, characters like Fahad Nazar and, you know, these, these people. Um, but also just to the whole elite neoliberal punditocracy. Um, <clears throat> there's an uh, event in Riyadh this October called the Future Investment Initiative that basically, I don't know, if I was an Illuminati conspiracist, it would confirm everything I believed. I mean, you have <laughs> um, Lynn DeForster Rothschild uh, there. You have... Uh, Andrew Ross Sorkin of the New York Times, Maria Bartiromo of CNBC. It's sponsored by CNN. Fox, no, no. Fox, yeah, sorry, Fox Business. Fox Business is a sponsor. The New York Times just pulled out today, but the Financial Times and CNN are still sponsoring it. I mean, the, the RT 10th anniversary was such a huge scandal, but here you have people going to this conference, which is personally hosted by Mohammed bin Salman. And these are the people, you know... David Petraeus will be there. He's been a big apologist for Bin Salman. These, I mean, you have Thomas Friedman, David Ignatius, all the top pundits. They've been really celebrating Bin Salman all this time. And now you have this incident, which kind of confirms what you've been saying all along, Ali, which is that uh, the, the idea of reform by a Saudi crown prince is an illusion, if not a complete whitewash, for something much worse. So do you think that given all the relationships that bin Salman has built among this kind of global transatlantic elite, uh, that he can still sell the idea of reform? Or is this uh, idea and the whole 2030 initiative uh, impossible to market anymore? I mean, the Saudis have always done that from the 1960s. You know, I hope you have a search engine that goes back to 1960s because I would love <laughs> to use it. But I mean, I have that piece of information. It's somewhere in my archive. In 1966, I believe, when uh, before I was born, the uh, Saudi uh, uh, government, represented by Helen Knowlton, issued the statement saying that Saudi Arabia is uh, going through massive social and political transformation. So this thing is that every Saudi leader is a reformer is nothing new. They've been saying it since the 50s, and uh, the, it's the people who get paid to say it. And, of course, there are people who are allied to certain uh, interests uh, within the U.S. government or, or business who want to make, to you know, to excuse their dealings with, uh, with these uh, people. Uh, and so that's why they say they are nice. Uh, I don't think uh, many of these apologists will, uh, will apologize because... Uh, 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 you know, you could disagree with the Khashoggi, but uh, 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 these apologists contributed to his murder. Yes. Uh, by the, by by them giving Mohammed bin Salman the assurance that he will be supported, and then that assurance and support made Mohammed bin Salman much more comfortable uh, to conduct this this murder. So I blame Thomas Friedman. 
I blame Ignatius, I blame those, uh, and Bill Gates and, and Jack of Twitter and uh, Zuckerberg and all these, and Oprah, these, these, these Mark Zuckerberg, honest, I, the Clintons. Uh, yeah. The, to be honest, to me, I, I have always said it. It has it, it has to do either with bribery, meaning you have to get paid to 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 market somebody like that, or it has to do with bigotry, uh, uh, because when you see uh, uh, the, when when you have an illusion, uh, or if, you know, mostly it's not even an illusion. People they want to sell you the illusion that an absolute monarchy could be a nice and genteel uh, uh, government. It, it it can't it can't be. You cannot have a, a, an absolute monarch that that's going to offer human rights or reforms. That's just you know it's impossible. Uh, so um, so I'm what I'm saying is that the problem I- here is cultural that we have people who are willing to sell like David Petraeus. He's going to will if you give him anything he will curse his mother. Uh, just give him money. <laughs> and there are people who hate Arabs and think that we cannot. Uh, uh, um, uh, we don't deserve something that the Americans of 1977 deserve, that we are incapable of being like the Americans of 1977. This is preposterous, obviously, and bigoted when you think of a population as backward, just like like uh, former ambassador uh, uh, to Saudi Arabia, Robert Jordan, was saying on CNN a few years ago when I was with him on the set. He was saying that oh, the people there are backward. So, I mean, that's bigotry. That's hatred of, of, a, uh, of a total population. Well, what we have brought one thing the Americans of uh, 1776 or 7 had to the Middle East, and that's slavery. To Libya. Um, <clears throat> we brought it back to Libya. So <laughs> there you go with that. Well, yeah, and, and on this subject, actually, Ali, I think we should name and shame a bit. I mean, we talked about Thomas Friedman. Um, Jada Leah published a really good article. It was by Abdullah al Aryan, and it's called 70 Years of the New York Times Describing Saudi Royals as Reformers. And Abdullah goes through, he finds all these archived reports from the New York Times and other mainstream news outlets, whitewashing, going back to 1953, whitewashing King Saud and, and others. So I'm wondering if you could talk about, you know, who are some of the figures uh, today in the corporate media, other than Thomas Friedman, who have played a big role in kind of selling this myth that Mohammed bin Salman is going to be the savior that, you know, revolutionizes not just the Middle East, but the entire world. I mean, you have, you have the, you know, he was, Mohammed bin Salman, when he came, he was received by, by Google, by uh, Twitter, and uh, you have to see the look on Mark Zuckerberg's face as if he was this uh, 18-year-old with her, with her, uh, you know, Prince Charming, and they were holding hands too. It was, it was shameful. <laughs> if you look at the media, you look at this Nora O'Donnell, I, yeah. what I call a Gaga moment when she was in front of, uh, you know, Mohammed bin Salman. This is that was not journalism, and that was 60 minutes for God's sake. It was one of the lowest points in American journalism when you see somebody like Nora O'Donnell, who's probably not been a journalist. Uh, interviewing somebody and making it a PR uh, uh, program to uh, and so I think we need to take back journalism from these people uh, be, you know uh, and and uh, really do s- uh, serious work in, in Washington the think tanks here none of them I've been here 18 years none of them invited me ever you know and I went to the Wilson Center I remember I said this is a public institution this is not private institution so you have been always inviting pro-Saudi speakers. You know, there is an alternative uh, voice. I am the alternative voice. There is nobody else. So I'm not saying that, oh, bring, uh, bring me, bring me. But, you know, the reality is there is no other alternative voice. And I'm not somebody who sells sandwiches, you know, in the corner. I've written, I'm an author, I'm a journalist. I have credentials, for God's sake. They wouldn't want to hear it. You know, I say, you know, you are a public institution. It's you. You should uh, be uh, balanced and fair, and that's your job. But they didn't want to hear it. I spoke to uh, uh, to, uh, to to, and you know, we have uh, this guy. Say he's American. Say you know, I am. I am the real deal. You know, I I am an insider. I know is something you don't know. But so and this this is true for CSIS for for other. And these are all Saudi-funded institutions. I mean, has the Atlantic Council said anything about Hashogji? No. No. Not one. I, I searched their site. Not one statement. Middle, Middle East Institute. But at the same time, look, you know, people uh, harp on Trump. At least Trump has said a few things. 
but look at uh, Ob- have you seen Obama saying anything about it or Hillary Clinton saying anything about it and they are not in government so you, you know right. this this is a problem across the board it has to do again with bigotry or, or, or and bribery or both and they don't think we deserve we you know brown arab muslim people we don't deserve uh, any simple rights you know who cares that's how they think uh, even if they don't have to do anything it's also about ensuring that you have a stable client state in the region because if the saudi royal family were overthrown the us has no idea who would replace them and the chances that that someone would replace them, the chances are that they would not be allied with Israel, they would not be trying to destroy Iran, they would not be, you know, pursuing the same foreign policy interests that, that the U.S. wants. Um, but on the subject of, of think tanks in D.C., I was actually going to mention, and, and all these people who have been whitewashing Mohammed bin Salman, one of my favorite articles thus far was in the Washington Post, where um, Khashoggi actually was a writer, and it was by Dennis Ross, you know, neocon yes. extraordinaire. He just did a paid speech for the MEK in New York, uh, and the MEK is funded by Saudi Arabia. Yeah, the MEK is the Iranian cult that wants to overthrow the yeah. Iranian government and, and has allied with Saddam Hussein. But Dennis Ross, who is at YNAP, that's the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, Policy which is APAC's, you know, outsourced think tank in D.C. As, as Ali just you know, alluded to, Dennis Ross wrote a hilarious op-ed in February and it's called America should get behind Saudi Arabia's revolutionary crown prince. He calls him a revolutionary. Yeah, he said I expected reform, but I saw a revolution, uh, and that's disgusting. And that's that's bribery, uh, you know. Because I I can assure you, I, no one would write this unless they're getting paid for, you know, either directly to them or to somebody uh, related to them. And that's been the Saudi the Saudi uh, style for forever. And they offered. They offered people uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, to, in exchange to, for writing, uh, stuff like that. But also you have people who's, who believe in them, in the U.S. government, uh, and right, right and left. And there is this myth, oh, there is no, no other uh, alternative to the Saudi government. When I first came here after graduating from Minnesota, I thought about it. And I said, you know, the Saudis always uh, promote their uh, uh, backward uh, uh, extreme uh, uh, extremist uh, opponents because to, to give the impression that oh we don't have there is no alternative to us and when I came on on, on stage I, this was not because I believe it only but also because I was uh, I was aware of it that no uh, we should be ahead of the Saudi monarchy in fact we should have a republic we should have something like the Americans did in 1977 we should uh, 17, no, 1777. So we need to be ahead. We need to share power. We need to have uh, ideals just like, uh, you know, uh, some of what's happening in the U.S. We need to do. We have to share power, devolve power to the people, the government by the people. I've used these terms for a long time. So that was why uh, they were angry at me. I mean, they took away my citizenship, my passport, jailed my brothers, tortured them, tried to lure me and kidnap me, spied on me. They, they even tried to buy me out. I had, I can tell you about it, you know, members of the ruling family, like the guy, the two crown princes, uh, uh, tried, and even King Abdullah and his crown prince, his people contacted me about coming back and, you know, settling anything, any differences and giving me, uh, you know, taking care of me. And I never took the deal. So the idea is, this is what they are afraid of, of an alternative that's better than them. An alternative that looks like maybe in the systems in the United States or in the West in general. Of course, you know, you have countries in, 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 like the US and the UK, they don't care. In fact, they will never say, and they have never said, we encourage a government that is uh, nationalist, that, that is elected, that, is, that represents the people, we support the people to for, and their aspiration. Like they do it with other countries, like in China or with Russia and, 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 um, and Iran, definitely. But they never say anything about that in Saudi Arabia. You know, heck, the State Department spent zero dollars in 50 years to promote human rights, or religious freedom, women rights in Saudi Arabia, zero. And I challenge anybody to show me uh, uh, that they have spent a single dollar on that. Yeah, I mean, this really lifts the mask off of the hypocrisy of U.S. empire. Um, and I think in Saudi Arabia there are, must be some misgivings about bin Salman and what he's doing. I mean, 
we, 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 we've talked about sort of the sources of the U.S.-Saudi special relationship. We haven't mentioned arms sales, but also, you know, surveillance equipment. Saudi Arabia is one of the most heavily surveilled countries on Earth. Uh, yes. the, their intelligence apparatus is actually very good because they have money to buy uh, the best equipment to spy on their own citizens with. Uh, and that really highlights what the most important thing is to... Um, the Saudi apparat, ruling apparatus, which is stability. And bin Salman, I think, has been the greatest threat to stability in Saudi Arabia and on the Arabian Peninsula uh, since I can remember. I, I don't know if you disagree, but my, my question is, um, you know, what are you hearing from inside Saudi Arabia about uh, dissent or even misgivings at very high levels about Bin Salman taking Saudi Arabia kind of into the abyss, including in Yemen, which I want you know Ben to talk about and ask you about. Um, do you think there's a possibility of some kind of palace coup in the future? Well, uh, just last night I heard that the Americans starting to think of an alternative here I, uh, of, uh, for uh, this mad guy, you know. Uh, uh, I don't know if they'll be able because he controls everything, but uh, you know, the, the, the Americans overthrew uh, Mr. Musaddaq, uh, an elected leader in the 50s, so they might try to overthrow this guy and maybe even in the, in the, in the monarchy. And I think that in, I always said that the best way is to get rid of the monarchy. It will be cheaper, it will be easier, because there are too many princes. You can't have this. It's a, it's a model that cannot survive. And when Mohammed bin Salman took over and basically concentrated power and made Saudi Arabia into S Salman Arabia, I thought this was part of the American uh, uh, limiting uh, the size and the influence of the ruling family uh, by cutting, basically uh, limiting the power in one uh, branch or one family. And that could be the case now. But now the, f the fact that Mohammed Salman kind of uh, embarrassed the U.S., we might see, uh, uh, you know, the Americans going into different directions. The Obama administration was promoting Mohammed bin Naif, who turned out to be a coke addict. Uh, and then uh, he's a brutal guy. And, and then the Obama administration promoted Mohammed bin Salman. It started under the Obama administration. Yeah. I remember, yeah. uh, you know, uh, that they brought him and they thought he would be good. And then um, he, he's received bi bipartisan support from Obama and Trump. Uh, but the, the, the Trump, uh, the Obama administration and the CIA director, Brennan was close to Mohammed bin, bin Naif for, for decades, for maybe uh, almost two decades. Right, and, right. He's, he, and he promoted him at the palace. If you remember, Mohammed bin Naif's position was assistant minister of interior, but he was going to the White House and meeting with Obama. You, you know, do you think the British assistant, not deputy, assistant minister of the interior would be hosted in the White House and met, meet with the president? I don't think so. Even right. if, if, the, if the minister of interior from, uh, from, from the UK would come here, he would not meet the president. So the, the Americans were, are involved in, this, uh, in the palace uh, intrigue and the choosing who rules the country because the Saudi monarchy has been loyal to the American uh, 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 government uh, for, for uh, now about 60, 70 years. So I think, uh, yes, uh, the, uh, the administration will continue to support, uh, but if, if they choose, they might turn their back on Mohammed bin Salman, but find another. But I think that would be costly. They will, will, it will end up nowhere. The best thing is to get rid of the, um, of the monarchy and find what's wrong with, uh, with uh, a model like, uh, uh, like Mexico. You know, you have democracy, and people at least are not killed for their opinion. Ali, really quickly, what you were discussing earlier with Khashoggi is how uh, he was loyal to different elements of the royal family. And I'm interested here really quickly, maybe you could talk about the kind of intra-royal fighting inside the Saudi ruling family. Um, and specifically, uh, last in 2017, last year, around November, there was a, a pretty large purge of opponents of Mohammed bin Salman who could potentially challenge his grip on, on the throne. Specifically in November of last year, there was a mysterious helicopter crash in which a prominent prince was killed. Of course, Mohammed bin Salman imprisoned several prominent people. And this purge, it got some media coverage, but it, there was not widespread condemn condemnation. We didn't see the same people romanticizing MBS talk about the fact that he was killing his political rivals. Um, so. 
the fact that Khashoggi was probably killed is not that surprising when you look at what MBS has been doing for the past year. But I'm wondering if you can talk about that violence inside the, the royal family. Um, because as you mentioned, there are a lot of princes and sometimes they kill each other to try to, to get access to the throne. So far, you know, the, the incident with the uh, with that prince, uh, Bin Mugran in the south, uh, that was not uh, like some people wanted to say it's a, it's a, it was a shot down or anything. I think it was very. It's, it reminds me of what uh, uh, J J John F. Kennedy Jr. did when he flew at night w without an instrument, and he you know he, he ended up in the in the bottom of the sea. This is was similar. A young pilot uh, in a helicopter under pressure from a young prince to fly and to go see places, and he ended up flying into uh, you know into a mountain top because. Uh, uh, he was flying at night. He was not familiar with the area. Uh, but uh, I think Mohammed bin Salman wanted maybe that uh, appearance that he was behind it. Uh, I don't think I don't think that the ca that's the case. Um, no evidence of it. But the uh, uh, you know the uh, you're talking about how he treated his cousins, and he did all of these crimes. Uh, and nobody said anything. He treated his cousins, uh, he arrested them, he kidnapped uh, three of them, at least one of them was a friend of mine, uh, or somebody I know, I wouldn't call him a friend really, but uh, uh, so when people didn't say anything about that, when you kidnap people from the heart of Europe, you can definitely kill and cut up uh, uh, a, a journalist in Turkey and people, he, that's his calculation. Uh, and you, you know when you arrest um, Walid bin Talal, take his money. Walid bin Talal has much more connections to in the West than than Jamal Khashoggi had uh, or whatever have. And uh, when the the reaction has been muted, uh, I think that encouraged uh, Mohammed Salman to carry. Uh, Walid bin Talal was jailed in the Ritz Carlton uh, during the purge, and he is one of the wealthiest people in the world. Has donated to Georgetown University here in Washington, and so. Remarkable that the reaction was so muted, is what you're saying. And fun yes, fact, uh, t and Bin Talal, fun fact, he actually owns more stocks of Twitter than Twitter's own founder. Yes, yes. Uh, but the, the, the thing is, people, uh, uh, they care about, uh, you know, their, 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 their buck. They want money, and that's how they do it. And um, uh, the jack of Twitter, or the mark of Facebook, and others, and Bill Gates, who with uh, this is the I think the most disgusting example to me is Bill Gates because oh he's a humanitarian philanthropist, but he invites MBS to his house. The number one killer of children in the world is Mohammed bin Salman, but uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Bill Gates invite him to to their house, to their own home. They were discussing uh, anti-cholera initiatives. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> in Yemen. And, and before we move to Yemen, I, I do want to close out with that in a moment here. The worst humanitarian catastrophe in the world created by the Saudi war since March 2015 uh, with staunch U.S. and U.K. support. But one other thing before we move to Yemen, and that's one of the things we would be derelict to not mention is the repression in Qatif. You mentioned Qatif earlier. This is the eastern region of Saudi Arabia that, that is Shia majority. There is a minority Shia population in Saudi Arabia, but um, the Shia are largely concentrated in the east of Qatif, which also happens to be one of the most oil-dense regions. And specifically, recently, when we saw this case with um, Jamal Khashoggi, we also saw a similar case that got much less attention, and that is that a Shia female activist, a feminist activist, um, Isra al Gumgum, she is actually likely going to be executed, and Mohammed bin Salman will the great reformer will actually break a new record. He'll be the first person to execute a women's rights activist. So can you talk about the repression in Katif? Also, of course, uh, we saw the execution of Sheikh Nimr Nimr, who was a, um, a Shia activist, who was a pro-democracy activist, who led protests in 2011 and 2012. So this is, of course, one execution in a long line of executions. And many of the executions have not targeted not just people like Khashoggi, who are royalists, or, or at least who are rather... Yeah, royalists, uh, yes. But also, they've, many of the executions have targeted the Shia minority and, and activists. The, the greatest number of uh, sentenced to execution at this moment are against Shia, uh, mostly protesters, and uh, um, uh, there is not a single uh, execution of uh, ISIS. Uh, uh, members in Saudi Arabia uh, because, uh, you know, th that's their, what they call their children. 
uh, it's important to, uh, while uh, you know, uh, sympathizing with the family of Jamal Khashoggi and condemning his murder, to to mention this fact that Jamal Khashoggi supported the execution of Sheikh Lamar and uh, was uh, against uh, his his call, uh, and uh, you know, sometimes in a very nasty way. Um, and it's unfortunate that Khashoggi is dead, uh, but it's haunting as well to see that the person who encouraged and supported and uh, uh, execution, dismemberment of uh, a peaceful, um, um, uh, uh, you know, leader of protest who spoke both on behalf of his own people and Qatif, uh, and uh, his statements uh, uh, rings strong that if you are a Shia and you oppress a Sunni, God doesn't love you. And if you are a Sunni and you are an oppressor Shia, God doesn't love you. Uh, and Mr. Khashoggi was calling this guy a sectarian. Uh, so, I mean, that's very... So, uh, uh, to somebody who defends uh, everyone is sectarian, but somebody who, um, who, uh, who uh, you know, calls for a, what he calls a Sunni alliance against the Shia is, is suddenly a reformer. So, I think that, the, yes, the oppression in Qatif, it has been supported by you know if if you can UK for example the UK the UK ambassador the British ambassador brazenly came to uh, you know the dist- the destroyed uh, section of Awamiya city and praised uh, the the government for doing what they have done and called the the population their terrorist. Yeah, and there are videos circulating on social media online that show uh, that in Awamiya, which is the town a Shia majority town in Qatif that was leveled to the ground parts yes. of it by the Saudi regime. And the, Turk, and the Turk and the UK ambassador to Saudi Arabia called uh, these people terrorists, including children. Yeah, which is horrible, but not just that. Video and social media shows that uh, the Saudi regime was using Canadian armored vehicles yes. sold by the Trudeau government and also using US-made weapons against yes. these the Shia activists yeah. in Awamiya. Yes. Yes, and uh, I, again, I think the UK government, which uh, we know supported ISIS through a uh, Twitter uh, account, calling other people terrorists, is, is 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 very rich. You know, the U the UK government uh, or the, the British government has has been responsible for many atrocities for the past two hundred years. Something that should should not let them uh, have any legitimacy when speaking about human rights or terrorism. Uh, uh, so we have to really speak up uh, about that. Uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, it, this whole thing is not, it's not about human rights, it's not about democracy, it's about interests of, of certain countries uh, in the region and the position that the, the U.S. Uh, uh, government is taking now, I, I, I'm i afraid it's it's about interest, not about, uh, you know, sincere concern for the life and safety of Jamal Khashoggi. Yeah. The executive director of RAND Corp's uh, board of directors actually said that same thing from an alternately opposed angle to the Associated Press, that the U.S.-Saudi special relationship is not based on any shared values, it's based on shared security interests. In other words, the U.S. geopolitics in the region and arms sales. Uh, But, you know, Ben has been covering, I think, you know, before Yemen was on the radar of most journalists in the U.S., Ben was focused on it uh, back in 2015. I think this would be a good place to end, Ben. Yeah, let's let's spend a few minutes here, Ali, talking about the war in Yemen. As I said, just to emphasize this point, because it doesn't get emphasized enough, Yemen is suffering from the worst humanitarian catastrophe in the entire world. The UN has re- been repeating this for over a year. Um, the war began, the current war began in, in March 2015. Saudi Arabia actually largely under the leadership at the time of Mohammed Salman. This was kind of his pet project, even before he was the crown prince. Um, But he was leading the initiative of of the war. Uh, Saudi Arabia claimed that this war would last a few weeks, that they would quickly oust the Houthis, the the Houthi movement known as Ansar Allah, from the capital Sana'a in Yemen. And of course, we're sitting here over 40 months later. The war is still continuing. Uh, the Houthis have actually been strengthened more than anything else and gotten much more wide support because they're fighting this international onslaught led by Saudi Arabia, but substantially also supported by the U.S. and the U.K. and, and also the United Arab Emirates. Um, currently right now, Saudi Arabia and the, and the UAE, with support from the U.S., are launching a brutal assault on Hodeida um, and the port of Hodeida, which is on the western tip of Yemen, um, is where 80% of humanitarian aid comes into the country. 
uh, humanitarian groups have warned for, for months that, that if this battle continues as it, as it has, that it could lead to mass famine in which millions of Yemenis are on the verge of starvation. Um, so there's a lot to address, and we can't talk about the entirety of the war. But I'm wondering, if, to start here, can you talk about Mohammed bin Salman's specific role in this war? Um, it's been bleeding the Saudi economy, but one of the reasons that he has been so hesitant to stop the war is because it was his pet project from the beginning. And by acknowledging that they lost the war, I think it would be a very big political blow to the new crown prince when he's trying to consolidate his power. Absolutely. If he stops the war, that means the military will turn against him, especially defeated military leaders. They're pissed off. Hmm. And uh, they might be pissed off to, uh, to you know, to, uh, um, to the degree that they might launch a coup. If you look at the region's history, you look at uh, Egypt, the, you know, the military took out the monarchy, and then it happened in, in Iraq, and then in Libya, and then ended up the population with the support of the, of the Iranian military took out the, the, the last monarchy uh, to fall in the Middle East. So there's an, always a fear from the, from the military to overthrow the monarchy. And uh, I think uh, the, the Americans might think about that too. You know, uh, a monarchy is not necessarily a thing. What if we have an officer support him and get rid of the monarchy so we can deal with, with a small group of people? That was the idea. Instead of dealing with an entire family, you deal with few people, uh, a military junta or something like that. So, and that will be easier to deal with, and they will be much more open about uh, giving people uh, rights, and then we will not have this, uh, you know, uh, stain on our record having relationship with these kind of uh, characters. I I think the, the war in Yemen uh, showed that uh, this world is not about uh, right or wrong. Uh, when you see that the UN itself stopped publishing numbers of civilian, uh, and you know it was it was disgusting to to read somebody like Peter Bergen saying, "Oh, 6,500 civilians have been killed." Oh my God, where was he all this time? He, he maybe he was living in 2012 or 2013. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the number of children killed in Yemen is over 100,000, but the UN is part of that cover-up because they stopped publishing the numbers. Uh, and uh, the World Health Organization stopped providing cholera treatment because, oh, they, had, they have other priorities. It just happened to be after they received $50 million from, from the Saudis. The UN, uh, uh, you know, Human Rights Commission, I remember I visited it. I'm, I'm the first uh, Saudi independent person to visit in 2001, that place. These, these organizations are corrupt, unfortunately, and you can buy them out. And the Saudis have the money to do that. So, And they're on the Human Rights Council. Yes, you know, they... they and yeah, and Saudi Arabia chairs the women's, a women's committee yes. in the Human Rights Council. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, you know, like I said, you know, what, why did the UN hold, hold and uh, the former uh, UN Secretary Ban Ki-moon said, oh, we, we, because we have other priority, they have to pull... That report said Saudi Arabia kills more children than any other country in Yemen. So they're basically, uh, you know, covering up and they stopped issuing that report because if we see the number, we, we will see uh, that the hundred, uh, over 100,000 children have been killed in Yemen due to bombing and starvation and, and disease caused by Saudi Arabia. So all of that has been uh, at, the, at the hand of MBS. The problem is, those people who are concerned in the U.S., those people who are supposedly concerned for Jamal Khashoggi, they continue to support his crimes in Yemen, which is much greater uh, uh, than than uh, killing and uh, kidnapping one one person. Uh, uh, so I, uh, this is really it's not, not a genuine concern. It is it is concern about making money and maybe the divide uh, and rule. It's like Kissinger said: let them fight it, and less than both side weapons. And uh, we make money and we destroy our enemy this way. And that's exactly what's happening. Yeah, on this subject of the death toll, really quickly, we, we discuss this in more detail in our episode on Yemen with Shireen al -Adami. But this is one of the most wild things to me because it shows the intense hypocrisy of media outlets and international organizations like UN bodies. In Syria, for instance... Uh, the UN stopped calculating the Syria death toll because they were unable to get accurate measures. Many of the groups that were supposedly monitoring it were extremely partisan, strongly pro-opposition. So in Syria, the death tolls have largely been, you know, exaggerated. Of, yeah, exaggerated, and they're from op pro-opposition groups. In Yemen, it's the exact opposite. The number of 
civilian casualties has actually decreased over time. For, for over two years now, media outlets have said at least 10,000 civilians have been killed in Yemen. However, more recently, that, figured, that figure was reduced to 6,000 civilians yes. killed. And to be fair, those 6,000 are the ones who they personally identified as dead. But, but actually, media reports are now reporting something that's 4,000 less, even while we have, we, we know that there have been tens of thousands of air sorties carried out. Every week, there's another report of a school, a hospital, uh, a civilian home that was bombed by Saudi Arabia with a U.S. or, or British bomb. But the death toll has actually decreased in the media reports. It's just so surreal. It is so surreal. We need we need a funder to work on it, Ben. We can put together the real numbers because Shireen, you and me and, and, and Max, we can put something together. We just need somebody to to fund <laughs> that, it. That might be a good time, uh, Ben, to to uh, mention our Patreon, patreon.com slash moderate rebels. Uh, if you are a uh, Gulf billionaire. Uh, I think you can donate un unlimited amounts there. I'm also working on an initiative to end the war in Yemen, which is to get a Yemeni child a column at the Washington Post, because maybe people in Washington might say something then. I agree. We need a, we need a, a Yemeni with a column at the Post. <laughs> I, they, by the way, they, they have declined to publish my uh, column uh, about uh, the, this issue. So. Uh, well, um, you're, you submitted a column to the Washington Post about the issue of Yemen, and they re refused no about to, about, the, about the, 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 and I, I, I basically I'm the dean of uh, Saudi dissidents in, in the United States, so uh, you know my voice was important, but uh, I don't think they wanted uh, my voice. That 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 really is fascinating to me. Uh, you know, I've been watching you for years, um, and uh, I've. To don't see anyone who's more articulate or uh, has, has as much moral clarity on this issue as you. So that's remarkable that the Washington Post would reject uh, an editorial from you. Uh, I hope that you can get it published elsewhere. Uh, it, you know, if not, there's always a great to <laughs> uh, You know. I'm having trouble getting my. I I, I kind of gave up on that on that on that whole world and started my own publication, Gray Zone Project, uh, which Ben contributes to. And uh, you know, I would I wish you luck in uh, keeping your voice out there. Um, Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks so much. Just just for viewers again, you can find Ali Al Ahmad on Twitter. He's very active. He's also the founder of the Institute for Gulf Affairs. Um, Ali, for people who want to see some of your writings and such, where where can they follow you? Go, 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 just Google my name or go, go to the Gulf Institute uh, website. Great. Well, thanks so much for joining us. It was it was an awesome conversation. And as Max said. I mean, your voice is so valuable, especially the fact that you're in Washington, D.C. You're in the belly of the beast, and no one is doing the work you're doing. So Thank thanks you. for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot, Alex. Thank you, sir. Thank you.